the last that we'll talk about here as far as the chest injuries is a pulmonary contusion. This is one of the types of injuries that gets missed quite a bit, only because you don't see a whole lot of signs and symptoms with it. It's more or less a diagnosis of exclusion because there's really nothing else left that could be compromised in the patient. What this particular injury compromises is ventilation to a certain degree, but more than anything else, it also compromises respiration. You see this happen a little bit more dramatically with children than what you do with adults because kids don't have very strong rib cages. They tend to bend more than they break. They don't have a lot of musculature and the average child really isn't that fat. So any blunt chest injury to a child allows more energy to get into the chest and as a result, kind of impart that energy into the lungs. Now with an adult, they have obviously a stronger chest. Some of us are a little more fluffy than others and or muscular. And so there's a little bit more padding, if you will, and a little bit more tensile strength in our ribs to reduce that energy input from some type of collision or impact or what have you. But even with adults, there's a significant amount of energy that's uh, imparted into the chest. It dissipates the lungs and it actually starts to tear the lung tissue. Now, your patient still will be in a lot of pain. So it's going to cause them to breathe a little bit more shallow and they're going to splint. So that causes a little bit of a ventilation problem just in and of itself. The other associated bruising to the rib cage, uh, maybe even a, a fracture that doesn't turn into a flail, but yet there's a fracture there, that can also add into the pain and also add into the instability of that patient being able to ventilate effectively. Lastly, what'll happen is that with a ventilation problem being in place, that also can affect that patient's overall mental status and that may start to change and you'll see that with the patient as well. Now, how does it affect respiration? Well, as those fractured areas, if you will, within the lung tissue, uh, the pulmonary capillaries, the um, other capillaries that are feeding other parts of the lungs are ruptured, they start to leak, right? As they start to leak, the likelihood is, is that, well, if they were damaged, those very small airways in the lower respiratory tract were probably also damaged and they get torn very easily as well. So now I've got blood in my tissue that now eventually leaks into the airways that have also been torn from this tremendous force that's been impacted into the chest. Now blood starts to collect within those lower airways. So what'll happen is that when blood gets in those little airways, it hits that nice warm air and immediately starts to coagulate. So that can also add into a ventilatory problem because air now won't be able to get past that clotted portion of that airway very well or at all. Okay? As this gets worse and worse, as more and more lung tissue starts to bleed, as more and more lung tissue is affected, there are going to be more and more airways that are going to be either partially or totally occluded. That cumulative effect will then affect that patient's respiration because now there's not going to be a lot of air that got into the alveoli. So the pressure in the alveoli is going to be relatively low compared to what it should be. And there's a very high likelihood that blood is also leaked into the space between the alveoli and the capillaries. So now you've got this huge space of blood between an air pocket and the actual blood vessel. And air won't travel, as we've talked about before, through solid material, in this case the blood, very well. So the exchange between the alveoli and the capillaries is poor at best. All right. As I said, more and more lung tissue gets involved, then that particular scenario gets played over and over and over again with each individual area where the alveoli or the areas above those alveoli that get blocked off from bleeding that's collected in there starts to occur. The thing is, how do we recognize this? It's a little bit difficult to do. Uh, one of the telltale signs is that you'll have a patient that obviously will have chest pain, but then what they will start to do eventually, because blood's caustic, right, now it's in those airways and it starts to irritate them. That person will start to cough, probably continuously 
to some degree. And then at some point, you will see either pink tinged or brighter red blood being coughed up at some point. That gets mistaken for pulmonary edema. That gets mistaken for esophageal ruptures sometimes. But if you look at the overall patient and you look at the mechanism of injury, and obviously that it's the chest that was injured, you may see bruising somewhere on the chest as well. You may detect the uh, tender spots where some ribs may have been fractured. Put all that together, okay, that's one sign that'll maybe lead you to the fact there's a pulmonary contusion. The other one would be, not only do you have that physical sign of blood coming up the airway as they're coughing, but when you listen to their lungs, it almost sounds like that they have patchy asthma. You'll hear wheezing, you'll hear diminished sounds in various pockets throughout the lungs where the damage was, because again, air can't move past these obstructions either at all, or when it does move past, remember airflow coming out of the lungs is a passive movement. There's no strength behind it. So if I have a partially occluded airway because either it's irritated and it collapses that way and constricts because of the blood, or because the blood is physically in that airway creating an obstruction, when the air passes over the top of it, that flow becomes turbulent. And that turbulence is what you pick up as the wheeze as they start to exhale. So blood on the outside, wheezing on the inside, difficulty breathing going along with that, those are probably your best ways to make a educated guess that the person has a pulmonary contusion. Now, as I said, this can affect not only their ventilation, but also respiration. And it can be pretty serious. Pulmonary contusions, especially in kids, are one of the number one killers as far as trauma goes. With adults, like I say, we're a little more resilient, but if there's a hard enough impact that causes a pulmonary contusion, a relatively large one, especially in an adult, it can be just as dangerous, if not fatal. So your management revolves around good ventilation, but most appropriate means. Now, at the basic level, what are we looking at? We're looking at, again, at least assisting uh, with oxygen uh, influx. So if they're breathing on their own still and they've got good depth, we hit them with as much oxygen as they can handle. Non-rebreather, 15 liters, go for it. If now, because they're getting hypoxic and their brain really isn't affecting very well, now they may start to slow their breathing down because the brain's kind of checking out. At that point, we may need to take over their ventilations for them, place an appropriate adjunct, okay, OPA, NPA, and ventilate your patient. If you're the only crew that's able to take care of me, you don't have a medic there, and you have the ability to, at some point, depending on the patient's condition, you might again, opt for some type of alternative device, such as an eye gel or King or LMA, whatever that you have, put that in to increase the airflow effectiveness and also the volume that you can deliver and monitor your patient. Now at the medic level, the only other option that we really have, uh, and this would center around two things, one to improve the ventilation, but also two to protect the airway because remember they're coughing up a lot of this blood is intubate the patient. Might go as far as having to RSI the patient, but in a lot of cases, if they're that severe, they may lose their gag reflex well before it comes down to administering medications to knock them out. But whatever the case may be, uh, good positive pressure through an ET tube. Uh, if you have a ventilator that's available, again, we may even go that route, follow your protocol to obviously apply the appropriate tidal volumes. Uh, but be very careful because remember those lower airways are compromised. They've been fractured and adding too much air in there may cause an extensive amount of air to leak into the lung tissue. And now we get a rupture and now we can develop a tension pneumothorax eventually much easier. So give enough to give that chest rise, get enough to maintain a decent pulse ox, if you're basic or the advanced level, whatever that you're doing and maintain that throughout your transport and hopefully that patient will have a decent outcome as a result. The four injuries, the flail chest, the tension pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade, and your pulmonary contusions, those are probably some of the most major injuries that will cause the most problems for your patient secondary to that traumatic chest injury. 
obviously, especially when we're talking about blunt injuries, but even penetration injuries, uh, remember that as there are so many vital structures pretty much compacted into a very small space, uh, even though we detected one particular injury, there's a very high possibility that other organs or blood vessels may also have been affected. So you have to watch your patient for the overall effect that may develop in certain cases. Uh, if they do, obviously treat them as you find them, but be ready for them to happen uh, in any case where if, for example, we have a penetration injury, uh, you see the path of the bullet and you actually have an exit wound. Um, remember, uh, bullets deflect, uh, they ricochet off things, and so that pathway that you may think is actually there may have made much wider and more structures may have been affected. So keep an open mind when you have those particular injuries. Um, blunt injuries, everything's on the table because the energy goes everywhere in the chest. And so any of those structures that are within the chest could be affected and you need to be ready for those consequences as well.